it is neat because uh, God just puts your heart like where you're at, you know. And not that our heart still isn't for all of Clarksville, but um, it's just cool to have different prayers. Like, you know, because when you drive down the road and God puts it on your heart, hey, pray for them or pray for that building, pray for that business, you know. And um, it's just cool because it's having new experiences like that all over again, you know, like day one. Um, but... This morning is a very special morning to me, to my heart, because we're finishing the book of Acts. And um, I don't know, it's kind of emotional to me, um, because I feel like we've been really with Paul and walking with him on this journey, and as he's been going through everything that he's been going through, and, um, and we're going to go with him all the way to the end, except the end doesn't really end <laughs> um, as uh, we'll see the way it ends it's not the end of Paul's life but we just kind of skip to what we know happens um, later on according to tradition um, and then right after this we get to dive into the book of Romans so it's not like we're done with Paul right so I'm excited about the book of Romans so um, but man my heart does I do feel Paul's heart as he's longing for, to, to minister to his people, the Jews, and, you know, everything that he's gone through. And, uh, you know, I titled this message, Finishing Well, because, I don't know, it seems easy to start well, right? <laughs> but to finish well, that's something else. And Paul finishes well, he really does. So on that, let me share this story real quick, and then we'll get into our text because I think this is a good opener for our message today. On a hot summer day, it was 1967, and a lot of you might know her, Johnny Erickson Tata. She dove into the Chesapeake Bay, and she lost touch with her body forever. Well, in this life anyways, right? <laughs> the story of her battle for her life, and even greater for her soul, is like totally well known today. And you know that if you've seen her speak, um, seeing and just she's an amazing uh influencer and you know if you've seen her in live audience um it just confirms what her first book be beautifully affirms about her you know she possesses one of the uncon most unconquerable spirits of our time and it's because of her strong relationship with jesus christ it's so amazing um what she's done and what sh what she's been able to just to keep I mean, imagine if you ever have a bad day and you start to complain, and I think about her, right? And I'd say, thank you, Lord. Her positive examples both shamed at times and lured us towards, like, increased our courage and our faith, you know, and our outlook on life. Um, the secret of this unchained spirit is taught in many passages in Scripture, including Acts 28. So our text this morning... We're going to be looking at another one, another person following the Lord with an unconquerable spirit, the Apostle Paul. And so from the time we met Paul on the road to Damascus, well, we, we knew him as Saul before that, uh, but he's lived a life of bravery and has done everything, though, through Christ, nothing on his own. So it's not to glory in himself, as he would never do that, it's, but it's glory unto Jesus Christ. But his missionary journeys, they reveal who he was as a man, uh, a man of God, and he refused to be repressed by anyone or anything. And as we've gone through, we've seen him withstand Elmaeus, the sorcerer, face to face. He was stoned in Lystra. His disciples, they're mourning there over his body, thinking he's dead, <laughs> his apparent corpse and and then he revives and he goes right back into Lystra, right? Um, he took a miserable beating in Philippi. And then him and Silas, they give their first a cappella worship concert in Europe, right? <laughs> he withstood the heady intellectualism of the Athens, the corruption of the Corinthians, and the violence of the Ephesians. And in Jerusalem, 
in Caesarea, he was amazing, facing the abuse of his own people, the Jews, and the Roman governors. And he inspired and encouraged others all throughout his lives, but in, la- in chapter 7, during the storm of the shipwreck. And Paul learned, or he warned, he warned the captain, if you remember last uh, Sunday, he warned the captain and the centurion, hey, it's not a good idea, maybe we shouldn't travel right now, this is a crazy storm. But they ignored him and they left Fair Havens, which is Crete, and they ended up being in the storm for like two weeks, man, just crazy storm. It carried them 600 miles, and then they shipwrecked on the island of Malta. They didn't know where they were until they got there, and then they kind of realized, where are we? Oh, we're, we're at that place. We're the... It's like there was only, like, to them it was natives there, you know. There was, there was, it was uh, um, a native island. And so chapter 28 is where we're beginning this morning, and Paul's going to be spreading the word of God to Rome with an unstoppable advance to all the people everywhere to the ends of the earth, which is a cool way to end the book because you remember in the beginning chapters, what's his mission to preach the gospel, right, in Judea and Samaria? Uh, Judea, Samaria, wait, what, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, right? And so right here we see him uh, as he's going to be preaching to Rome, and it goes out through there, all throughout Europe, So the story's not over yet, even though we're coming to the end of the book this morning. But it's not also over because we have the same Holy Spirit that lives in us, right? The Holy Spirit that lives in me, lives in you. And God is using us. And I pray that we will be like Paul, that we won't just start well, but that we finish well, right? That's my prayer. Dear Lord, we just come before you this morning and we ask, Lord... We want to finish well, Lord, and whatever it is that you have for us, Lord God, it's, that time is difficult. Uh, maybe it seems like a simple task, but it's never simple, God, whether you're a mother or a father or a husband or a wife or, or a, a widow. or Lord, it's, there's a lot of things in this world that make things difficult. But God, no matter what the situation, what the scenario, you've always got a plan And there's always something that you have for us to do. Um, And so we just ask, God, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. You would equip us, God, continue to equip us for the work that you have before us. And that we could be faithful in that, Lord. That one day we too, when we go home, we'll hear those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Uh, Just love you, God. We praise you and just ask that you would open up your word to us this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. So verse 1. Says, now when they had escaped, they escaped the storm. They then found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us unusual kindness for the kind the, 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 the they kindled a fire and made us welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. So Luke is referring to the people here on Malta. Really, the text is barbarians uh, in the in the Greek, but New King James it says natives. But that doesn't sound very nice, right? Kind of, especially if you're reading it from our culture only in mind. But from the Roman point of view, that wasn't uh, derogatory or anything. You know, calling them barbarians. All it meant to them it was saying. They didn't speak Greek, right, or they didn't speak Latin. It was like a word that we'd use for a foreigner, right, like they're foreigners. But then today, that's probably not even a good word, right? <laughs> it's like you don't know what you can say or not say anymore. It's like, um, but these guys, apparently they were not uh, very nice uh, as far as according to what we see. Luke, as he states, they were met with unusual kindness. So I think they were uh, kind of shocked by that, the way Luke writes, you know, even though the temperature wasn't that cold, probably maybe 50 degrees, but they had just weathered the storm and they're exhausted and they're uh, hanging on to, you know, parts of the ship and they make it to the beach. And the wind is, it's raining and the wind is blowing like crazy. They're probably freezing. Um, and so these guys take them in. There's a cave where they take them in and they light a fire. And 
Um, and they just they bless these guys. You know, it's interesting because over generations, um, humanity has always had the same enemy, right? <laughs> Satan. <laughs> And he, he's, he doesn't get tired. He doesn't slow down. He doesn't get weary because of his age, right? And he, he uses the same tricks, the same playbook. It's never changed. And so when I think of, you know, the foreigners, you know, in my mind, I think that whether or not these guys were, um, you know, friendly or not friendly or whatever, like, um, Maybe they weren't, un- maybe they were friendly, but people are just like, hey, if people are different in our culture, like we're humanity is like, if people are different, like they're scary <laughs> for some reason, right? Like people are just scared of the unknown, right? It's just the way people are, the way people are wired. But, and so, I mean, it says that they were unfriendly, basically. He kind of leans that way, which then again uh, could be so because on that island there, um, Malta, if you look it up, it's pretty interesting. There's multiple wars that have been there. They've been like, they're this little island and they've been in the middle of all these wars throughout the ages. Their uh, people are originally from Phoenicia, but the Muslims conquered them and they ruled this little island until the Vikings wiped out the Muslims and then Malta became one of the main players during the Crusades. And uh, then they became a part of Britain because Britain thought that was a strategic place. And now they're a part of the European Union, but um, they still speak Arabic in most places. And um, it's just a really neat place. Uh, but one of the greatest events that ever occurred on the island was Paul's shipwreck. Um, and so because of that, Christianity spread throughout all the island and all throughout Rome as well. It's the, the, the site where the wreck took place, where they washed up on shore, is actually known as St. Paul's Island. And there's a statue there today if you want to, you can go see it if you go. I would love to go. That'd be awesome. Um, and then there's this big cave where they took shelter and had the fire and everything. It's called Paul's uh, Grotto. And if you um, want to know the rest of the history, you just got to read the book of Acts, right? That's what we're going to do. Verse, next verse here, verse 3. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and he laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and he fastened on his hand. So Paul's being a servant. He's going out and he's, I mean, he's Paul, but I mean, he's like, I'm going to go get some sticks and feed the fire, right? Well, apparently one of the pieces of wood that he had, like maybe probably inside it or whatever, there was a viper and as he gets close to throw it in the fire, the thing like jumps out and latches on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man's a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. So the word justice here is probably referring to the Roman goddess because, um, you know, it's in the Roman area over there and, uh, Basically, the Roman goddess, justice, ensured that criminals got what they deserved, right? So in my mind, it's kind of like karma, right? You, what comes around goes around type of thing. You know what's interesting to me? Do you know Christians that believe in karma? <laughs> I mean, I, Christians don't say that they believe in karma, probably. But a lot of them that I know, they'll say things and I'm like, that's like karma, man. <laughs> like, it's not, we're not, it's not karma, right? We don't believe in karma. Um, the problem with karma is that when you, you know, you're thinking that you do good deeds, and then because of those good deeds, good things come. But when you do that, you're removing God from the picture, and you forget that, wait a minute, God is the one in charge. <laughs> He's the one in control, right? Um, and so uh, that's not Christianity. Christianity is when we hang out with Jesus, and as we do so, he changes us. And then we become more like Christ. And as we become more like Christ, well, then you're living your best life now, right? That's what we're doing. You know, it's like that whole, that quote, live your best life now, you know. Well, you don't get there by a self-help book. You get there by following Jesus Christ. And so we don't believe in karma. We believe in Jesus Christ. But I think sometimes, you know, the Bible talks about little things that can creep into our faith, right? And it doesn't happen overnight, right? 
It's a slow fade, right? Just like that song, right? Um, but if we hang on to the word of God, if we stay in our word, then we won't be tossed to and fro from like the waves, right? But the truth is, sometimes when I'm getting close to God, you could say you're on fire, right? Like you're not cold, you're not lukewarm, you're, you're hot, you're close to Jesus, right? Like Paul getting ready to put the wood in there, and then right then things aren't going the way you think they should, and you get a viper latched onto you, right? You're like, wait, I thought I was close. I'm like doing good, right? <laughs> why, why am I getting bit by this viper, Lord, you know? But the truth is that's how it is sometimes. Sometimes when we're near the fire, that's Satan loves to attach onto us then, right? Because he, he hates the fact that you're getting close to God. He doesn't want you to be on fire for Jesus Christ. He hates you on fire with the Lord. So if I do things to get closer to God according to karma, good will happen to equalize the energy of the earth, right? You can't have the yin without the yang, right, or whatever. People th and then people think we're weird for worshiping Jesus. I'm like, okay. <laughs> that sounds kind of strange to me. Um, I'm sorry. Sometimes you just have the yang and the yin instead of the yin and the yang. You know what I'm saying? It just doesn't work that way. Uh, but sometimes it's hard being a believer because we get caught up in the idea that, hey, I've been doing good. So God is going to bless me, right? You know? And, but we're looking at it wrong if we look at it that way because the truth is God's already blessed us, right? God has blessed you and blessed me, and he continues to do so because he loves to love his kids. That's why he does it, not because you earn it. Definitely not because you earn it. It has nothing to do with that. It's what he's done on the cross. To these islanders, Paul, he must have deserved to die, right? Because here he is, he escaped from this shipwreck, and so they're thinking his only fate next is that you know, he's going to be killed by this viper because he must be a murderer or something. And karma's going to get him, right? So no doubt this is an attack from the enemy, though, really. And God is going to use it for an opportunity for Paul to share the gospel. Because, you know, uh, that's what happens. Today it's the same for us, right? Sometimes we're close to the fire. We're, we, not as in, like, close to God, but maybe you're close to the fires and we feel like quitting, right? Or you feel like God's not there. And because of the heat... Uh, you're just struggling. And then not only that, this viper comes out of nowhere and he bites you <laughs> and then grabs onto you, you know, in the same scenario, same sense. Um, that could be tough too. And, you know, usually when that happens, just like these guys, what happened when this viper snapped, clapped, clamped onto Paul, those guys instantly were watching, like, what's going to happen? This guy's going to die, right? Like, and it's funny how that seems to happen, right? Whenever we're in the fire or we're not doing well with our walk or whatever, and then the viper snatches you, <laughs> grabs on, and then the world's watching you, probably the ones that you've been witnessing to, the ones you've been sharing the gospel with, the ones you've been ministering to, and they're, they're watching, they're not believers, and they're like, what's going to happen? Is this guy going to die? Is he going to fall in his faith? And in a sense, their flesh is kind of like going, I hope so. <laughs> because they might, you know, you might be the only thing that's convicting them in, in any way in their life. And for you to die, for you to fall in your faith would give them peace in a sense, right? Um, usually the world knows better what the Bible says a lot of times than Christians, right? And they'll point it out to you. Hey, the Bible says you ain't supposed to do that, right? <laughs> Sometimes they're way off. But, um, but it's interesting how the enemy... Even when he tries to come in, whether you're close to the Lord, whether you feel like you're on fire, or whether you feel like you're on fire, <laughs> um, the enemy is going to come, man. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Let's see what Paul does. Watch his response here. He shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. So Paul immediately recognizes this viper for what it is, right? And he responds by shaking it off, throwing it in the fire. And I was thinking about that. Sometimes I allow myself to be in this like frozen state. The Holy Spirit's saying, rip it off, man, throw it in the fire, right? 
You're going to get venom in you if you, if you let this thing cling on to you. <clears throat> and you're like frozen. And instead of immediately just throwing a viper off, I respond passively and I'll say something like this to God. Well, if God wants this viper attached to me or doesn't want this viper attached to me, then he'll remove it. You know, and it's like, that's not Christianity, man. <clears throat> you know, usually that's when I'm going to place a temptation and that's one way of me just justifying my actions, right? I just say, hey, I'm not doing anything, Lord. I'm not actively taking part in this. It's just happening to me. You know, I'm a helpless victim here, you know. It's like, that's not the case because you have the Holy Spirit living in you. Wrong, Colby, you're a sinner. And instead of sitting there, you need to shake off the viper, right? But sometimes, clinging to Jesus or abiding in the vine, that's what it requires, man, is shaking off the, the viper. Just because you're hanging in the vine, hanging, clinging to the vine and hanging out with Jesus and doing everything right, that's all part of it, man, is shaking off the viper and, being, and under, taking it for what it is, right? Seeing sin as God sees sin. Do you ever think about that? If we could see sin the way God sees sin, think about it. His son took our sin and to the point where he, Jesus looked up and said to the father, why have you forsaken me, right? Because of our sin. And then here we are playing these little games in our mind, dabbling in it. And God's like going, what in the world are you doing, man? I sent my son to die for that so that you don't have to be chained to that. And here you are free in Christ, and you're playing games, that's, you know, and I just, when I think of that, I just pray at times, God, help me to see sin the way you see sin. And then I have to say, Lord, and help me remember where I came from, because I don't want to be somebody that's like, <laughs> instantly you can go from that place to somebody that's like pointing out sin, right? Being a sin sniffer. And we're not that either, right? <laughs> um, but I think in our, if we don't have in our minds preparation where, you know, uh, this is, Christianity is, Paul didn't have it easy. <laughs> you know that as we've been walking with him. It's not always comfortable when you're near the fire, right? <laughs> we get caught off guard sometimes, I think, that time at the most, probably because we think that, like, especially right after surviving the shipwreck, right? Something came in your life and you're like, man, I'm going to, and then you go, I did well. I clung to Jesus and I didn't fall. And, I have victory, and now you feel really good about yourself. And right about the time you start to celebrate, bam, there's the viper, man. <laughs> you know? Yes, Lord, you're amazing. You pulled me out of that wreck, and then boom. Sometimes I think that's the enemy's favorite time to catch us off guard as well, in the middle of our celebration. In the army, when you're driving down the road, in Iraq, they would set IEDs, you know, to set us up. <clears throat> but we would develop technology. We had these things called rhinos. They would go on the front of the trucks, and they're weird-looking black things. With a, they were weird-looking. But at first, I remember when I first got in the Army, I was like, what is that thing? You know, it looks ridiculous, this big thing hanging off the front of the truck. It's like a, it looks like a big flag, but it's huge. And it was to catch the sensors of the rockets because they would go off when that thing would cross, and then they'd miss, right, because... It was set up to be a sensor where when the truck was there, it would hit the truck. Well, so they would just, just miss you, you know. But then they would, you know, set up plates in the ground with IEDs. Or they'd have someone sitting over here with a, a trigger, the trigger man, and he would wait and time it. Um, but, you know, they, they got wise because they started doing secondary devices, right? So they would set up a little IED. And then you would be celebrating your victory. They missed us. Yeah. You know, and then boom, there's the big one would come right afterwards. And it was just to catch you off guard. It wasn't even about the first one, you know. And I think sometimes that's how the enemy is with us. That, um, you know, we, we, you know we, we start to look at things as, yay, I'm doing well, or yay, I'm not doing well. And it's, the truth is, is this. We're always doing well, even if I'm in the middle of a firefight because Christ is in me and I'm with Christ and everything's always good, even if I don't experience good, 
I have to remember the worst thing this world could do to me is send me to heaven, right? And I, I can't get caught up in this whole game of like ups and downs and um, it's just exhausting. But we need to be prepared as soldiers, right? To not just walk around aimlessly when it comes to sin. We have to be prepared to react and respond appropriately, right? Verse 6 says, however, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. So they're watching him. But after they had looked for a long time and they saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds. How fickle, right? <laughs> uh, they changed their minds and said that he's a god. Oh, man, I keep thinking this is where they got the idea for that one movie, man, uh, where those little, what are those little creatures, man? And they're like, they're worshiping him. Uh, no, the other one, man, when they're, you guys know the one movie. Uh, huh? Ice Age, Ice Age huh, right? Yeah, when the little, what's that guy called? Sis, Sist? What? Sid. Yeah, Sid. Remember, he becomes like the king, the god, or whatever, and they're worshiping, whatever. I'm like, that whole movie is from chapter 28 of Rax, <laughs> man. It's so funny. <laughs> um, you know, one minute they're, you know, they're like, he's going to die. You know, he's an evil murderer. And then the next minute, they're like, no, he's God. Let's worship him. You know, it's like, this is how the world is. You know, we're so fickle. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. If you turn there, you can. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Paul's getting ready to speak here, Corinthians, to the Corinthians. Well, even if it takes a minute for us to shake off the enemy, Right? Know this, some of his venom, even if it's injected into your bloodstream, you got the blood of Jesus Christ running through your veins, man. And Jesus Christ, his blood has conquered sin and death. Roman, or 1 Corinthians 15, 58, 5 through 58 says, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. That's the strength of the sin is the law. But what did Jesus do? He fulfilled the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brethren, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In that religion, or in that region, there was an, uh, a state of the leading citizen on the island. His name was Publius. And so uh, he received us and entertained us courteously for three days. So he's like the head honcho on the island, the, the leading man on the island. His name is Publius. So he allows Paul and his companions to stay there and to lodge for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island, verse 9, who had diseases also came and were healed. So Paul is healing these guys, uh, his father, and then he's curing a bunch of these people on the island that, have, that are diseased. And, you know, God allows Paul to perform all these miracles. Um, and it's amazing because God is in control. And God knows that because of these miracles, Later on, about three months from now, uh, they're going to assist Paul and his party as they head back to Rome. Um, but thinking about, you know, Satan's going to put obstacles in your way, of course. But we've got God, man. And so when it comes to the enemy doing that to us, they're like speed bumps, man. <laughs> in all reality, he's trying to slow you down. It looks like a wall to you sometimes, but you get there and you're like, oh. Speed bump. I got Jesus, man, you know. Nothing can stop me. <clears throat> so God gave this gift of healing to Paul. Um, now, I was thinking about that. When you have the gift of healing, you know, you see the guys on TV when they're like, every week there's a show and they heal people and it's all a show, right? Um, when you have the gift of healing, it's not something that you own, and perform whenever you want, right? It's not like a magician or something. Like, you don't own this power. God is the one that heals. When you're obedient to seek God, and God says, hey, 
heal that guy. And you do it, and God does it. He can choose to do so. And that's the way it works. So when Paul wrote to Rome, or he wrote from Rome years later, about two years later, he wrote this concerning Ephrodites in Philippians 2.25. He says this, Yet I considered it necessary to send you Ephroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier. But your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick, almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So Epaphroditus, he lived, but Paul wasn't able to heal him uh, for the mission, right? They thought he was going to die. God did bless him and give him mercy, and he lived. But it wasn't like Paul just laid hands on him and healed him, you know? Well, why didn't he just do that if he has this power to do so, right? I'm sure he was praying for him, right? But sometimes it takes time, right? Sometimes you see God heal over time. Sometimes God will heal right then. But it's not coming from you. It's not your power. In 2 Timothy 4.20, I'll just read it. Paul states that he had to leave Trophimus sick, this, a friend, another guy, um, in Miletus. We covered that when we were going through um, Acts. It brings it up. In 2 Timothy 4.20, it says, Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. And you're like, well, I thought you could heal everybody, Paul, you know. Paul wasn't able to heal Trophimus. It's God that heals when he chooses. And I think that's just a good picture and a reminder not to fall for those name it and claim it. Um, or, or for you to believe that you're not healed or you're not able to heal someone else because it's your lack of faith. You know, I'm like, that is so not true. Don't think that way. That is like inappropriate thinking and it's actually... This is false. Yes, God does sometimes act in response to our faith, right? He might say, hey, because of this guy's faith, I am going to heal. He's done that in Scripture. There's other times, though, the person has no faith and he heals, right? Lazarus was dead, right? And he was healed. You know, so the, the, it all comes down to the fact that God's going to do what he's going to do. In 2 Timothy 2.13 it says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. I love that. Because if I'm faithless, my God is still faithful. And that's what Timothy, that's what Paul says uh, writing to Timothy. If we're faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. Because Christ is in you. And he's faithful, even when I'm not. So if someone else is being healed isn't going to be based upon my faith, right? It's not going to be based upon your faith. You're not going to get sick because you didn't have enough faith, right? That's crazy. They stayed at Malta during November, December, and January. And then they sell on a grain ship that was wintered on the island. So after three months, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers verse 11, which had wintered on the island. So here they go, headed for Rome again. But Luke describes the ship, its figurehead, right? It's got these two sons of Zeus that were the figureheads. Um, they were considered by the Romans uh, the patrons of navigation. So they're on the ship, and if they were in the middle of a storm and they saw their constellation, which was Gemini, then it was good fortune for the ship, right? And when you read this, you're like, Luke, why are you putting this in here? Like, uh, this seems like information that's unnecessary. But everything in the Bible is necessary, and it all has a purpose, right? I like that Luke mentions this. It's not pointless. Um, God can use anything to bring him glory. And this probably wouldn't be the ship of choice, right? If, if Paul was going to go and witness and share the gospel, let's take the ship that's like basically worshiping false gods, right? Uh, declaring that, you know, that's what we believe. He wouldn't take that ship, but he doesn't have a choice. He's a prisoner. In 1 John 4, 4, it says, You are of God, little children, 
and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So Luke mentioning the ship's description, I love it because it's a good reminder that though we live in a fallen world, we're overcomers. Paul even takes it farther in the book of Romans, chapter 8, 37. He says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors. That phrase, more than conquerors, it describes an army whenever they would conquer their adversary. They, they were more than conquered. The enemy would not only conquer them, but they would use their own resources, their own people, and they would use them for their advantage. Like, remember Daniel when he was taken captive? by Nebuchadnezzar, and he took all the smartest and the best of the men, and he would train them up and use them for his advantage against the enemy, which was them, their own families, you know, their own people. So in Christ, we're more than conquerors. So whatever the enemy uses, we don't just overcome it, but we're more than conquerors. We use the very thing that Satan means for evil, and we turn it for our good. Even if it's just like a simple ship that God's like, well, I'll use that ship because it's going to Rome. That's where I need to get Paul. And I just think that's a pretty cool picture of that. Um, that God can do anything and use anything. It doesn't matter what the owner of the ship believes. Jesus Christ is the only God. And Zeus is just an imaginary myth that God will use for his glory. God will use Zeus for his glory. <laughs> right? Isn't that cool? We are more than conquerors. We don't just conquer sin. We don't just conquer the enemy. But God turns all things to good for those that love him, right? So verse 12 says, landing at Syracuse, we stayed three days. So they stayed three days. And from there, we circled around and reached Regium. And after one day, the south wind blew. And the next day, we came to Putiali, Putiali, however you say that. Uh, it's like that uh, smelly stuff people wear at petroleum. <laughs> so at Rigium, they had to wait for a south wind to get them through the strait between uh, Sicily and Italy. And so where, where, where we were found, or where we found brethren and were invited to stay with them seven days. And so we went towards Rome. So there at Petoli, the principal port there in southern Italy, they find some believers there. And since the centurion, he probably had business there, and that's what took place. You know, hey, I got stuff to do over here. But then because of that, they, begin, they got to fellowship for a week and stay in that place. And verse 15 says, and from there we went, uh, from there when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Appi Forum and th three inns. You can see that on the map. So it's like far. These people that Paul had been ministering to, they all find, they all know where Paul is. And so they come to meet him at his house. They come meet us as far as Appi Forum and the three inns. Where Paul saw them he and he thanked God and he took courage there's nothing more encouraging than hanging out with the believers, right? Like when you are in that place where maybe you feel far from the fire, right? Or maybe you feel like you're in the fire and you get to be around other believers. And I'm talking about like real fellowship. The amazing thing is, is God knows when we need that. And many times I think today, if God is dispatching believers to be that encouragement, just like these guys were, but yet I wonder if encouragement is not found by the believer that's in need because the believers that heard the call, maybe they're too busy with their own business instead of God's business, you know? And then also on the other side of that, as believers, I think um, the divine appointments might be missed because the one that's to be the receiver doesn't let people in, right? They can't receive encouragement through the other believers because the door to that believer's heart is closed, right? And I just, I think that a lot of times that seems to be the case, you know, that if we weren't so closed, um, that God would actually allow people 
or the people that he's dispatched could come and have an effect in your life. But as believers, we need to be ready to be dispatched, right? And willing to be that encouragement. And we know, God knows when we need it. And when we need it, we're thankful when that person is obedient. Um, even if, I know Melissa tells me sometimes she'll be at Mission Barbecue and, <clears throat> you know, she has a, a thing where she goes to each table three times to talk to them about Mission Barbecue's mission. And sometimes she'll look at the person and tell they don't really want to talk to you. But she still does the three time rule, you know, to make sure like that she's doing her job well. And I think of it like that, you know, like, um, I think a lot of times we'll go to that person because we're dispatched and then it's their flesh that's a little prickly, <laughs> right? And they're like, get away from me. <laughs> um, well, the amazing thing is, is Melissa, because she does this free trip thing, just the other day she had an awesome experience and someone that she totally thought was not going to open up because he seemed like a hard, tough soldier dude, you know? And then he did. Um, and Melissa shared a story, and it was incredible. You should ask her about it. Let tell, tell, she'll tell you about it later. But it's like, phew, be ready to cry, though. <laughs> but it was just cool, because she said that guy just, like, totally opened up all of a sudden. It was like, phew, just changed, you know? And I was just thinking, man, I, I wish it was like that with the Christian believers, you know, in fellowship, that we wouldn't just give up so easily on one another, you know? It's almost like we don't want to annoy anybody, right? I think we're supposed to risk at being the one that's annoying. <laughs> I think we are, to, to be that risk, right? I mean, do you think Paul was annoying maybe sometimes? <laughs> I'm pretty sure he was. Um, so now we came to Rome in verse 16. The centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. So he has all kinds of awesome privileges. And it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to them, Men and brethren, though I have done nothing against our people or, or, or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. So in Rome, Paul is now permitted to live in a private apartment type place. And, but he's chained to this guard. So he enjoys this awesome freedom, and he gets to preach, he gets to write, he gets to receive visitors and encouragement. And immediately, though, what does Paul do? He calls the local Jewish leaders together. You know, I would have been thinking, leave them dudes out of this, man. The, the Jews have been horrible everywhere you go, man, and you just want to stir them up again, you know. But Paul's on a mission. He calls them immediately, the Jewish leaders together, and he puts his case before them, and he requests that they would all come and, and, and hear him. And so uh, verse 18 says, who when they had examined me, wanted to let me go. He's explaining what took place before he came to Rome. He's saying that, you know, the Jews examined, examined me, they couldn't find anything wrong with me. The Romans wanted to let them go. But because there was no cause, for, you know, there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see, for, called for you to see you and speak with you, because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. Man, the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. So, I mean, the very fact that he would even, I mean, he's going to preach it to these guys, and it's not going to be. Here's some tea and coffee and, you know, some brownies or whatever. And there's the God above, the higher power, and he loves you. Like, you know, it's not going to be a message like that. It's going to be truth, man, and hard to hear. And Paul is in chains because of the hope of Israel. That's why he is bound with his chain. And all I could think about when I was reading this was, what am I bound to in this world? Like, what am I bound to? And I was thinking, husbands, don't say it's your wife on a ball and chain. Don't do that, all right? Because that's not true. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Come on. But I don't mean that. I mean, 
the things in your lives that weigh us down, what's weighing you down? What is it that I have displayed on the front of my ship, right? It might not be a false god like Zeus's twins, sons, but is it the car that I drive or, or is it the life that I display at work, right? When I'm there, my job, Maybe it's the status that you have in the world or maybe the clothes you wear, right? Like, what is it that you are, are you enchained to? Is it, are we enchained because of our walk with Jesus Christ? Like, what does the world see displayed in front of my ship? I want it to be Jesus. And I'm not talking about my Christian t-shirt, right? I don't mean that. Or your Calvary Chapel sticker that's on my car. Um... But it's, it's who or what do I, do I serve? Paul's chains were for the gospel. In verse 21, he says, Then they say to him, We neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or unspoken any evil of you. Like they're saying, we don't, we don't know anything, man. Which is probably not true because the gospel had been going out everywhere and they totally knew about the way, you know. Verse 22, but we desire to hear from you what you think concerning this sect. We know that it is spoken against everywhere. So it kind of gives it away here. A minute ago they said they don't know anything and now they're like, they're calling it a sect. Well, obviously you know something about it because you're calling it a sect, right? Um, Christianity was known for many years at this point. And there was this huge division at the time over, um, even that Emperor Claudius banished all the Jews from the city of Rome. So these guys, they didn't want anything to do with Paul or Christianity. And so uh, you see their true thoughts as they say that uh, Christianity is a sect, because that word sect in the Greek means heresy. That's where the word comes from. <laughs> so it's, they're like, we don't know anything about what you're talking about, this heresy thing. You know? Oh, I didn't say it was a heresy. <laughs> you know? Obviously, they know about it. So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. So tons of people, large numbers are coming to apostles where he's living, which is amazing. Uh, most exciting home Bible study in history, right? <laughs> right here at Paul's place. Uh, the word translated explained means to set out or place before. And so Paul gives his argument with detailed logic and care, and he's, this, he's excited to do this. And he does it from morning till evening, it says. So this isn't just like an hour study with cookies and punch, right? This is 12 hours of serious discussion. <coughs> and it was going on daily. And so some were persuaded, verse 24, by the things which were spoken, and some, dis some disbelieved. So the Apostle Paul, he was a fighter. You know, he's, some are persuaded, and some simply they don't believe, no matter what he says, no matter his passion or the Holy Spirit's urging, Holy Spirit's calling and drawing. Um, there's a saying, and this is true, that the same fire that melts wax hardens clay, <laughs> right? And that's so true. The same fire that melts wax hardens clay. And it's really like that's what Paul's job was. He was hardening clay or he was melting wax, you know, everywhere he went. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah, the prophet to our fathers. It's funny, he says one word and then he goes on about <laughs> and well, he must know he's a preacher. Um, the Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah, the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. So God's people are told that however much they hear and see, they'll never understand and perceive what God's saying to them. 
that's a divine judgment because they themselves, they made their hearts impervious to the word of God, right? They didn't want to hear it. And they allowed themselves to become deaf and blind because they knew, it's like they were fearing. You ever see a believer or a non-believer when they're in fear that they might hear and see the truth? So they don't want to hear it because they don't want to believe, right? They don't want to hear the disturbing word of God and that they know that they'll receive healing from God, right? They don't want that. And so it's crazy. You know, God's word it brings a diagnosis to us, right, of sin. That's what you come to, this great conclusion. I'm a sinner. And it's painful to hear that and to accept that. But at the same time, it, the wounds, it wounds in order to heal, right? We know that. It wounds in order to heal. But when someone deliberately refuses the word, the Bible talks about this point where they can be deprived of even the capacity to receive it. Paul talks about it in Romans where they sear their heart. That's a stern warning for those that trifle with the gospel. That's a scary place to be in. And Paul just lays it out there for them and tells them straightforward. You're, you don't hear because you don't want to hear. In verse 27, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. So it's interesting because when Paul is saying this, he's, he's reading this from Isaiah, right? He's quoting Isaiah. But when you're hearing it, you're either on one side or the other. You're on one side of going, whoa, that's amazing. I was there and I see where they're at, but I'm not there now. I believe, right? Because he said some believed. Or you're the, on the other side of going, eh like this guy Paul you know and um, it's just amazing how the Bible does that it always it, it doesn't it, it speaks straightforward right and and your heart is the one that determine how are you receiving that right are you receiving that like yes I have a dull heart or are you receiving that as man I'm so glad that I don't have a dull heart Lord that that, um, that you saved me, you know? And so it's just cool how that works. Paul's just preaching the gospel, and God is dividing them left and right. It says they either believe or they don't believe. And verse 28 says, Therefore let it be known to you that the, the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. Because God's using the Gentiles to cause the Jews to be jealous, right? And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves so that the goal was met, right? They're, they're leaving and they're disputing among themselves, right? That's awesome. That's what you want, right? You want people to leave from a Bible study, not necessarily all in one accord going, amen, 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 but maybe going, I don't know, what do you think about that? What do you think about that? I don't know. Let's, let's dig into the word deeper and, see, and find out, you know? Like hopefully that's the goal that... Um, because it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, right? And Paul can't save these guys, but all he can do is share the truth. And when he shares the truth, look what happens. They depart and they dispute among themselves. It's not in Paul's hands. It's not in Paul's hands. Paul's just being obedient. And then Paul dwelt two years in his own rented house, and he received all who came to him. So he's paying for it, actually. <laughs> So he's receiving everyone that comes in and is coming to him. So he's still preaching the gospel, man, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concerning, concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. No one forbidding him. So basically unhindered. So Acts ends without this recording of the fate of the great gospel or the great apostle Paul. Um, and we're like, well, what happens? What, what happened to Paul, right? <laughs> was he found guilty? Was he executed? Well, most people believe that at this time, specifically, Paul was acquitted. But then later on, he was arrested in Macedonia. And when he was arrested there, those charges, like, stuck, and they were considered extreme. And by then, Nero, was, he, would been, he had been unleashed, um, you know, his with his furious like persecution of the Christians. 
So whether there's one imprisonment or there was two or, you know, we're not sure exactly, but <clears throat> tradition shows that he did die a martyr. He was a Roman citizen and um, he died by penalty of the sword. It places him in the um, Mamertine prison, adjacent to the Roman forum. So you can go there today again and see um, it's believed that he was executed on the Ostian Way, which is outside the walls of Rome. Um, you can go there, and there's a church there now, and it's called St. Paul's Without the Walls. That's the name of the church. It stands, um, uh, it's still there. So Paul's beheaded under Nero, and Paul didn't just begin well, but he finished well, right? He kept to his principles, to know and to preach nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And when we're serving in our own business, we have to remember, right? What, WWJD kind of thing? <laughs> um, what am I doing, right? Does it have anything to do with bringing me closer to Jesus? Am I, am I, is it helping me walk closer to God? Um, we should remember to ask this question. What does this concern the Lord Jesus in my life? And Paul, he didn't preach of himself, you know, but Christ. He wasn't ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And in his last days, he was placed in a, he had a very narrow opportunity, right? You, you know, he could have just kind of hung out to himself and, you know, spent time doing whatever. But no, he used that narrow opportunity. Um, and though it wasn't a wide door that was open to him, he, he, used, he did many things in that little door opening that was there. In fact, in, fact, in Philippians 4.2, I'll just read it to you. It says, there were saints even in Nero's household. So we learn that you know, even Nero's household was getting saved because these guys are guards being chained to Paul you know, over this whole time period. And he was preaching the gospel to him. And so how cool is that? Even Nero's household, was they had believers. That's incredible. In Philippians 1.13, um, it talks about how God overruled Paul's imprison, imprisonment for the furtherance of the gospel. Not the residents at Rome only, but um, all the Church of Christ. Um, and so... Uh, that's true because not just for Rome, not just for the Jews, not just for the Gentiles then, but we have been given the Gospels, where the epistles, the book of Romans. During Paul's prime of his life, here he is, detained a prisoner. And it was from his prison that he was chained with one hand, right? And with the other hand, he wrote the epistles, the Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Probably he wrote Hebrews. We believe that. I do. And so I pray to, to live more and more in the love of Jesus, our Savior, and to labor, to glory him, glorify him in everything that I do, everything that we do, by his strength, um, among the number of those who overcome our enemies, right? By his grace and mercy, that we would finish well. That's my prayer. Um, and uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the Apostle Paul and your relationship with him, God, as we kind of joined with him many times in this book. Even though on this side of the cross, we see things differently with the opportunity that he didn't have. There's still times where we don't understand and go, wow. It's because you're God. And Lord, I just pray that help us to translate that into our lives that you're, you're God. And Lord, that we would live differently because you're God. And that we would be able to have peace, God, in our lives, even when we're in the storm. And that, Lord, not that we would just live to survive as believers, God, but we want to be used by you. 
kind of know we started well. God, that day we surrendered, and we, it wasn't us. It was really you drawing us, and we said, yes, Lord. And we were born again. All things were made new. And we could see, and the scales fell from our eyes, and all we wanted to do was serve you, God, follow you more than anything else. And that's how we started, God, and I just pray, help us to finish well. Now that we have been matured more in our walk, God, and, you know, the world has beat us up, and the enemy has poured out his tricks, and we've had times where we're bitten, and he's clung on to us, and where we maybe didn't let go like we should have, or thrown him in the fire. And God, in the end, all that seems to take a toll on us, God. We just get beat up as Christians, God. And but I just pray, God, that we too, like Paul, could reckon the flesh, the body dead. That we died with Christ on the cross. And that, Lord, that we would live unto Christ. That we would live to die as gain, but to live as Christ, Lord. That we would have that same response as Paul. So many of those things that he said that we hang on to that are true and that are actually just deeper than what a normal person without Christ can ever grasp. The fact that we're dead, but we're alive in Christ. And God, we want to live that way. We want to live for you. We started well. We pray that you help us finish well, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.